Well, they say the uh, longevity is the great revenge. But I, I tell you, there's something else about longevity. It's the opportunity to hear things said very nicely about you that normally only get into the obituaries. <laughs> I, I had uh, two very strong uh, sensations as I was hearing this. Uh, one is, I wish I could turn a phrase today like I could 40 years ago. <laughs> Uh, the other is, I wish I looked like that. <laughs> I think I'll give some of the background on my own Austrian connection, uh, because it is perhaps stronger than uh, many people realize, and indeed stronger than I realized for a long, long time. I, I had two years of happy association with uh, Lou Rockwell, I don't recall us ever even the phrase Austrian. Uh, we may have, we may have been doing some of it, but uh, those were those were really the early days. Murray Rothbard was still around. Uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, congratulated me personally on that university speech, which was originally after the Liberty Fund was given at a uh, feast of fee program as an invited lecture, and uh, he thought it was just right on, so you're right on too. <clears throat> but my connection is, is an unusual one, and uh, it's someone whose name was mentioned only in passing, but who played a gigantic role in my life. I, I can't conceive of having the kind of career I've had, but for this one individual. And I'll tell you a little of the background of it. Uh, to avoid military service after I finished law school for as long as I could, uh, I only postponed it, I went to Yale Law School for a year. You could still get student deferments. I had finished three years at Chicago where I had come heavily under the influence of Aaron Director, uh, less so Milton Friedman, but Hayek was there. Uh, Aaron was closer to an Austrian than many people uh, understood. And, of course, Frank Knight was still uh, flourishing at that time. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, year at Yale started off, I, I just realized, it was a total bust. Uh, the fads and reputations of law schools and universities generally usually lag by many, many, many years. Chicago was a great and exciting and intellectual, high-powered university. Yale was child's play. Uh, they just weren't doing anything in the law school that was anywhere near as intellectually interesting as what I had encountered at Chicago. And so I spent the year largely catching up on readings that I had learned about while at Chicago, including most of Hayek's work, and I claim to be one of the few people in the world to have read human action in that first very bad uh, translation, too. Nonetheless, that's a part of the story, because three or four years later, I had started uh, law teaching, and was invited to a small conference. Uh, again, may have played a role in my own uh, career, by a man named Arthur Kemp. Some of you may remember uh, Kemp was one of the stalwarts of the Mont Pelerin Society and a strong uh, Hayekian. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, he put on these uh, summer programs, two-week programs for young professors. I, I don't I really don't know how my name came to uh, his attention. I was invited. But the three speakers were Felix Morley, John Hicks, the famous economist from uh, Oxford, who had just then spent a year with Aaron Director at Chicago, and a man named Armin Alchin. I'd never heard of him. But the very first session, the first day, the first moments, uh, I think there were 15, 16 young professors sitting around, Armin at a podium, reading a paragraph. And he said, does anyone know where that came from? I did. 
I recognized it as coming from human action. Now, I didn't think much of it then. Uh, at uh, the break from that, Armin went on to give what became, I think, perhaps, uh, for me, the most significant economics article ever, uh, called The Economics of Property Rights, uh, certainly right up there with evolution, uncertainty, and economic theory. But Armin preferred playing golf. He, he, he really, really wasn't very... Uh, uh, energetically ambitious uh, as an academic. As a result, that was in 1957. As a result, that article was published in the Il Publico in 1965, after the Coase Theorem appeared. Tremendous overlap with the Coase Theorem. Had Armin gotten that out earlier, I have no doubt that he would have been uh, a Nobel laureate today. Uh, and that article would be vastly better known than it is. The thrust of it was the thrust of uh, one of the key points that Mises was dealing with in human action. Namely, that you can have a, a market, in, to use a, a phrase that has some currency today, uh, that qualities of human qualities that are desirable, honor, virtue, uh, uh, loyalty, any of these things can be the subject of human exchange. We make choices about them. We subjectively evaluate them in our exchange in our day-to-day -day life. Well, that was uh, the point of human action, and that was the point of Armand's property rights theory. Though I think, to, in all fairness, that's not the central point that most people have taken out of that article, though that article is, is still, I think, the beginnings of modern property rights theory. Many years later, and after a, a lifetime of uh, wonderful friendship with Armin Alchin, I called his attention to that day. I'd, I'd always wondered about it. Where did he pick up that quote from human action? Oh, he said, that was very simple. When he was a Ph.D. student at Stanford, he was the only student who had the guts, the courage, the brains to do, to do a Ph.D. dissertation under the famous Alan Wallace. Now, Wallace was one of the famous threesome of Frank Knight students, Milton Friedman, George Stigler, and Alan Wallace, Wallace later went on to be president of the University of Rochester and undersecretary of state under George Shultz. Uh, also, I, I think a founding member of the Mont Pelerin Society. He said that Wallace had put him on to Mises. And there this whole connection came back. Uh, and <clears throat> long after that, you know, at one time, may come as a surprise to some of you here, particularly after some of the almost nice things that were said about the Austrian Chicago nexus. For years in Mont Pelerin society meetings, there was inevitably a panel on what was the difference between Austrian economics and uh, the University of Chicago economics. And it was a bitter feud every time, except it was much about nothing the overlap was so much vastly greater than the real differences. Uh, certainly there were significant differences of emphasis, particularly on empirical work, I might say, uh, that uh, it's not true, not fair to say that they were the same. They weren't all that different. And one could come out of a Chicago background with a, a little bit of an Austrian uh, whitewash on it from Mises and Alchin uh, and Hayek and, uh, and really uh, have gotten the best of both worlds. <clears throat> the, uh, so that's sort of the background of this. Now, incidentally, uh, I want to correct a couple of things. At the time I wrote the Insider Trading book, uh, Kirzner had already written about the entrepreneur, not that... Uh, that book, uh, Capitalism, Competition. Uh, Competition and Entrepreneurship, that came out a little later. But the thrust of it already existed, and it is cited in, in that book. And uh, he was very generous 
to me. I, I've always had just gigantic re re regard for Israel. Uh, he was very kind about that work and about the uh, most recent piece of mine that Alex mentioned on uh, compensation of entrepreneurship. Uh, I made my day when I sent it to uh, Israel and he wrote back, this is a breath of fresh air. So I, at least I figured I was on the right track, uh, <clears throat> even though I, I never closely identified myself, uh, mainly because I just I never was one for labeling myself uh, any more as an Austrian than as a non-Austrian. I was very close to the public choice group, both before they were at George Mason and afterwards. I had very good friends in the economics departments at, at, at George Mason. Uh, but I just never gave much thought to the labeling, and uh, I think we even now do too much of it, even though there's a lot less of it now than there used to be. Well, to get on to some of the substantive things, uh, I want to correct one thing, uh, having said nice things about Mises, I want to correct something that uh, Peter said, because it's come up before, and not just from Peter. Uh, Others have noticed a similarity between my concept of the market for corporate control and Mises' reference to fundamentally the Berlian means uh, hypothesis. Not the same. The context in which he was writing was, the thrust of it was, capital markets restrain managers. Not that a market for corporate control exists. He has no reference and no recognition of a market in votes. Now, that came out of public choice theory much later, introduced, incidentally, introduced to me by Armin Alchin, who told me to take a look at Anthony Downs' book that preceded uh, Buchanan and Tulloch and was uh, a consummate work if, if not really the original work in uh, public choice theory. Uh, but you can, you can see again the connection, uh, the idea here, the uh, Alchin idea, my stuff. Uh, I, I often, I'm, I'm not by nature a modest person, but I often do think that I, I, it's a little bit exaggerated. Some of these things just flowed out of what I had done. I had had the good fortune of, meeting Armin Alchin, reading uh, Anthony Downs, uh, knowing a little bit about uh, Hayek and Mises. All these things came together so naturally that I had a terrible time and was in the academic world. It was, it was gruesome. It was no fun, I can tell you. Economists weren't quite so bad. Uh, in fact, I used to get nice invitations to economics conferences and... Uh, I was once nominated to be vice president of the Southern Economics Association. That was the highest ranking I ever got among economists, but uh, it was nice anyway. Nothing like that happened in law. I can tell you a story. Uh, when I first met the great guru of securities regulation, a man named Louis Loss at Harvard Law School, he was a god figure to every law professor in the securities field. Somebody grabbed me and took me over to introduce me to Louis Loss. His back was to us and so he said, Lou, I'd like you to meet Henry Manny. He turned around and he said, we didn't need a book on insider trading. I know it's wrong. And he turned around and walked away. Well, there were a few people standing there, and I was able to come up with one of those great remarks. I said, that is the level of intellectual discourse at the Harvard Law School. <laughs> I've always loved that. <laughs> it was true. That was my name because of these articles that I had written that were certainly had to be noticed uh, in the JPE, in the Columbia Law Review, in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, my name would come up regularly at every major law school and just as regularly the leading guy in Harvard in co uh, corporation law would say, we can't have a conservative kook like that on this faculty. 
there was there was there was no generosity of spirit. There was there incidentally was one person who strangely enough did not fit that category. That was Adolf Burley. I decimated Burley in the 62 article. There was nothing left to his economic theory of, of, of Burleyan means. I mean, literally, it was gone. That was a whole, what do you call it, a, a paradigm change from one short article. He didn't understand it, but he knew that it was important. And he made a real effort to get me on the faculty at Columbia Law School. It was only vetoed by Bill Carey, later the chairman of the SEC and the author of the Law on Insider Trading. Uh, he and I were never terribly friendly. <coughs> uh, uh, I want to say a word about the libertarian view criticism of corporation law. I think it's, it is a domination of uh, principle carried to an extreme. There, are, there is an argument that limited liability could have been invented and indeed was well underway as an invention of the common law. Now, we know that by and large it existed outside of the torts field. Uh, where you had involuntary creditors. Uh, legislation corrected that problem almost overnight when it was recognized. And that is the corporations didn't have limited liability for paying off injuries to workers. That was late 19th century legislation, but that happened. I think the limited liability was one of the great inventions, and I know it's a terrible uh, venue in which to give credit, it's perhaps the one invention I can think of that the government was right about. I, I thought long and hard about I've given up on central banking. Uh, I've given up on a few other things. But I think the limited liability is right because it allowed a securities market to exist that could not exist without it. Now, I don't want to push that too far because I think there were things the common law could have done. Uh, for instance, one of the reasons you had to have a rule of limited liability if you were to have a broad scale popular bond uh, stock stock market, you had to have some low cost method of dealing with the liability of millions uh, in those days tens or hundreds of thousands of shareholders. We didn't even have class actions then. Uh, the joint actions that the common law allowed would have been impossible. And so, in effect, you would have had limited liability anyway, simply because the cost of going against those shareholders would have been too great. The alternative and lasted in the law in uh, New York and a couple of other states until well into the 20th century in banks only, was unlimited liability. And what happens was you always went for the deep pocket. You would go only for the very wealthy shareholder because it was joint and several liability, uh, and they didn't have limited liability. Well, the problem with that, of course, was that you'd never get one person to put a lot of money into a venture unless you could get a lot of people putting a small amount in that would be the limit of their uh, liability. Uh, or, excuse me, excuse me, you'd get only poor people coming into these things. Wealthy people wouldn't do it because it, a tiny infraction could put their entire estate at risk because they might be the only selected plaintiff. At any rate, uh, those are arguments in favor of limited liability, and I think they're pretty strong arguments, and uh, I'm not sure we'd have as free a system as we have without it. <clears throat> I'm going to turn to uh, Alex's very nice uh, comments about my insider trading article and the role that it's played in... <laughs> generating God, not merely a, a lot of articles, a, a, a whole a whole institution. <clears throat>
It's just astounding when you look at a bibliography today of articles on insider trading and realize, as uh, Alex said, there were two law pieces mentioning insider trading prior to 1966. One was Burley and Means that has literally in passing one of the uh, problems with separation of ownership and control was that managers could engage in insider trading. They didn't say anything else. It was a minor problem. Uh, the other was a 1914 article, notice long, long before, indeed long before we really had a popular stock market, uh, but it appeared in the Michigan Law Review in 1914, and it made most of the moral and ethical arguments that we still hear. <clears throat> the vitriol that I suffered, or that I heard as a result of that book, so I got some benefits out of that book too, and still do, uh, <clears throat> But the hostility and the vitriol and the hatred and the bitterness astounded me. I just could not understand it. I didn't have any any axe to grind. I thought I was just writing a economics uh, analysis of something that people would either disprove or prove. But I didn't think they'd get so very angry about it. Louis Lawson's comment is an illustration. And I've troubled about that for a long, long time until really only in very recent years have I come to understand something about that. And I think a lesson about human nature and psychology, one that goes far beyond the insider trading issue and in, in, in involves us with much larger questions that uh, Mises and Hayek addressed for a long time. And that is that the power of the psychology of envy in the human mind is gigantic. Uh, I'd never really appreciated this. I mean, we all know that envy is there. Uh, teenagers envy the, the uh, straight teeth of their colleagues. They envy the, the fashion jeans that uh, their friends are wearing. And, you know, that's sort of the level we put it at. Then we think... Well, we also envy very wealthy people. That's uh, another human trait that we find, particularly among a lot of uh, leftists in the United States. Nobody is worth getting $22 million a year. Nobody should be worth $3 billion or $30 billion or whatever Gates or Buffett is. Uh, and yet, I think a lot of that missed the point. That was a comparison of wealth. I think the nature of envy, this human psychology, is a little different. And I think it comes to the fore with the idea that the stock market's a lotto, and I should have just as much a chance to win the, the lottery as Tom or Alex or anyone else. And yet, these guys on the inside... They've got something unfair because they're winning and I'm not. Now, notice that that necessarily incorporates an ignorance about how markets work. Certainly indicates an ignorance how a market for information works. But I think it does explain the, 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 uh, the intensity of the emotion on the insider trading subject. They, any of you can go out of here next week, go to a cocktail party, mention the phrase insider trading, and you'll get it immediately. You'll just hear it. It's, uh, it's astounding how, uh, how uh, ubiquitous it is. Uh, well, that, that's my explanation of what uh, I think is going on there. Uh, Kevin, excuse me, actually, we're, we're really out of time. Oh, well. um, but why don't we take a few extra minutes if it's okay? Um, would you like to entertain a question or two now, just in case people have to run out? Uh, no, I'd rather give two cute points. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> one is uh, one that uh, uh, that uh, better 
Rich Vetter omitted. Uh, and he omitted it because maybe because I didn't have it in the original article, but somewhere later I published it, but I've never been able to find it, but I've given it in speeches a lot of times. The original blame for the qual poor quality of American universities today, of which uh, Richard did a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, telling the scenario of, of what it looks like, all starts in a very, very strange place, but it's a great little bit of historical uh, uh, trivia that you can tell use in stories. It all begins with Henry VIII's domestic relations problems. He was married to Catherine of Aragon. He didn't like her for whatever reason. I don't know if it's political or romantic or what. Uh, he wanted to get rid of her, and so he asked the Pope to give him an annulment, and the Pope wouldn't do it. And so he said, well, the hell with the Pope and the hell with the Catholic Church. We disestablished the Church. Now, thereby hangs one of the incredible accidents of legal and economic history. Because in the earliest common law, dating back uh, the earlier, much earlier Henry's, uh, back into the 13th century, there was a doctrine in common law First of all, there was a, a, a rule known as the rule against perpetuities. It was a wonderful rule and is, is a wonderful rule today. What it says is that the title to property cannot be kept off the market forever, only for a life and lives and being or, or a few months later. Uh, <clears throat> what that did was... The common law built in a rule that said ever so often, every generation or so, every piece of property has to be subject to a market test. That was a salutary rule, and it is today, and it's a wonderful rule. There were three exceptions in the time of Henry VIII. The crown, naturally the crown went on forever and could own property in perpetuity, Municipal corporations, which, like for some of the same reason as today's corporations, were a revolving uh, continuity of organization, so they could own property in perpetuity. And the third was the Catholic Church. The Church could own property in perpetuity. When he disestablished the Church, all the church institutions, including the universities, no longer had the benefit of the exception to the rule against perpetuities. The professors and dons and lecturers at Oxford and Cambridge and where else were up in arms, obviously. Here they lived this charmed existence of, of what our professors live in today, and all of a sudden, since this rule against, this exception to the rule against perpetuities was removed, they were going to be out on the market. There was going to be a competitive market for education. They didn't want that. And so they brought enormous pressure. Henry gave in, went to Parliament, and got them to adopt something called the Statute of Charitable Uses. I think 1528, I'm not exactly sure. It became part of the English common law, even though it was a statute, and was adopted as part of the English common law in the colonies and in the early United States, and has remained ever since. And that's why charities, including universities, have this god-awful structure they do of Freedom from any market test, any form of competition, any of the restraints or uh, uh, beneficent, benign uh, effects of having property rights because they can exist in perpetuity. So uh, our problems with the universities, Henry VIII's problem. Uh, I'll stop there. I, I, I wanted to get that one in because I love that story. <laughs> Mismanaged our time by letting people rent so it's on way more than it should have. But uh, there's another session that begins here at 4:30, so the calls will close now. But uh, I'm sure that Professor Manning will be happy to answer any questions during the breaks uh, the rest of the day. Thank you all.